Hey everyone, Natalie Antonov again for Gable Music Ventures with another interview for you. Uh, we're trying to bring you closer to some music industry experts that might be able to give you some tips and advice to get you where you're going just a little bit faster. Today we have an interview with Ron Ozer of Arden Guild Hall. Uh, he's the executive director of the Arden Concert Guild and he produces shows at Arden Guild Hall, which is 30 minutes south of Philly in Arden, Delaware. Uh, the 170-year-old venue has over 112 years of hosting community events and, in more recent history, performances by artists like Loka Kani, David Bromberg, and Kaki King, among others. Uh, Ron joined NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association, in 2020, and he was a precinct captain lobbying for the Save Our Stages Act, which just passed, and continues to support Delaware music venues in writing grants and securing funding. Uh, most people don't know this, but this is an entirely volunteer career for Ron. Um, he also just happens to be a PhD chemical engineer with 25 years at DuPont as a research scientist, has four years teaching as a professor at Villanova, and is an engineering consultant. We've got a lot to get into with Ron, so let's get to it. Hey, Ron, how you doing? Doing well, thank you. Awesome. Hey, um, so I absolutely have so much to get into, but I really wanted to start off with just saying, you know, congratulations on the lifelong career in engineering, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'd love to know when and why did you decide to get yourself involved in the music industry? Well, um, in the, uh, I've always been really into music. In fact, I had a record review show on our high school TV channel uh, many years ago. And I, about 20 years ago, I decided to join the concert guild here in Arden, which at the time was doing just a couple shows a year. And eventually I took it over and we expanded it year after year. And it's, uh, it's up to about 20 shows a year now, at least pre-pandemic. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, it let, it's let me combine my uh, love of music with actually um, bringing it, especially unusual kinds of music, to Delaware in, in a way that people might not see it otherwise. It Was that hard to get started doing? Yeah, it's a, honestly, it's a whole career of its own. And I've met a lot of people who do it for a living and they, and they teach me things. And I, I continue to learn uh, after 20 years you know, there's a whole process of negotiating um, all the things you need for a good live event, uh, how to sell tickets, which changes every year. And um, there's just uh, that if it didn't keep changing, maybe it wouldn't be as interesting. But thankfully, there's always music I love that I want to bring to Delaware. So. Well, that's really cool. And especially the fact that, I mean, it's it's all volunteer and you know, coming from from my standpoint in the music industry and what we do at Gable Music, it, it's just so impressive that that you can take on all of that at the same time. So um, thank you for that volunteer work. I'm sure the music scene around here is just so much better for it. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. I uh, I get the perks of getting to meet a lot of these artists and uh, seeing the sound checks and and all that stuff. So that's cool too. That's pretty awesome. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about the Arden Guild Hall. It's it's a it's a well aged, multi purpose venue, um, and I'd like to know a little bit of history about the building, maybe types of shows that go on there. Just kind of give everybody a little bit of a background on that. Yeah, Arden Guild Hall uh, started as the Derrickson Barn in like 1850, mm -hmm. and in uh, 1900 the town of Arden was founded by some kind of eccentrics from Philadelphia who wanted to bring this social philosophy of Henry George and the arts and crafts thoughts of William Morris to bear in the woods of Delaware, though it wasn't as wooded then. <laughs> and, uh, they named it after the Forest of Arden and Shakespeare as you like it. And music and theater have always been a big part of this community. Um, Lead Belly played here in 1947, Pete Seeger in 1948, Burl Ives here. Uh, Arden Town had the the Summerstock Theaters with Anthony Hopkins and Jack Klugman. So we're an extension of that kind of intentional utopian community that was started in 1900 
and that still exists today. Now, now is there, I, I need, I need to be taught this and I'm sure I'm not the only one with this question, but, um, what, what is a guild? <clears throat> well, I mean, the idea is kind of based on the old, uh, Belgian guild halls where you had, you know, craftspeople and, and in the old days, there was a, you know, a, a pottery guild and a, a, a knitting guild and all that kind of stuff. And then as well as Shakespeare and Gilbert and Sullivan. And, and we still have, you know, Shakespeare, Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, we have a poetry or writing guild. Mm -hmm. We've got the swimming guild where the swimming pool is <laughs> and the dinner guild that makes dinners, community dinners that are often right before our concerts. And uh, the only weird thing about it is that we spell it G-I-L-D because mm -hmm. of some smart spelling movement that happened in 1900 where they would eliminate all the extra letters from words. So you don't need that U for just <laughs> G-I-L-D. G-I-L-D. And, and so, so guilds are, are they more so the, the group of people than, than an actual, like a building or anything? It's just a group of people working together to do right. something? The Arden Guildhall is run by the Arden Club. It's a 501c3 nonprofit community organization. Mm -hmm. And any 18 people can get together and form a guild and get approved by the board. Uh, in fact, the concert started out as a committee and mm -hmm. became a guild a year after I joined, which gave us a lot more autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, each guild can kind of set its own path as long as it's not losing tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, I think I have a little better understanding as to what, what all that is. So you have, you have the Arden Guild Club and then the Arden Concert Guild among other guilds. Right. And right. then the hall, which is the building. Yeah, the guild hall is the building. And of course, you know, we all have to contribute to the upkeep of the building. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an old building and you know, just replacing the whole roof structure was a couple hundred thousand dollars a few years ago. Wow, wow. So in in as much, do you find most of your time working as the director of the concert guild spent at the hall or well, not lately, <laughs> but uh, no, I actually, I mean, I could do most of my work on the computer and only have to be there really uh, for concerts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 20 nights a year, almost every concert I'm there mm -hmm. uh, from two o'clock on uh, uh, for sound check to make, you know, buying stuff for the band backstage, you know, at the local, at Trader Joe's or whatever. So all those uh, rider lists. <laughs> going through the lists. Uh, you know, making sure if the sound people are coming, the light person's available, um, that we have the backline instruments for the band, uh, things like that, yeah. Yeah, all that heavy, heavy production lifting on, on live event shows. We're very familiar with that. <laughs> mm -hmm, I'm sure. So, uh, so other than that uh, day of event type stuff that you just went over that you do, uh, what what other stuff do you do leading up to the shows uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as a director of the building? Well, um, a lot of our work is just paying attention to, to what's happening uh, in the concert business, who's going out on tour, uh, who's releasing new records, new artists that are up and coming, trying to get them uh, booked before they get too big for us in some <laughs> cases. Uh, or, um, and then we find, uh, I have a team of people and we're all always looking for artists. And and if we find someone we like, we present it to the team, either in person or on Zoom or on email. And uh, we have to come up with a budget. You know, how much can we afford to pay that person, that artist, that band, depending on their, um, you know, uh, ticket price and, and the expenses that are gonna be for that show. and you know, obviously we factor in any expenses that might come up and uh, try to make some money, hopefully, on the show as well to help pay for our uh, building. Right, right. And you mentioned your team. Is it a small team, big team? How many you had on there? But technically, we have, I think, 12 people or 13 on the team. I would say five or six are very active. Um, three or four, maybe five, are actually booking shows meaning that they're the lead producer for a show. Um, I'm typically involved to some extent in every show in promotion, uh, marketing, uh, the email emails I do, 
uh, a lot of the social media I do. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'm often, you know, I have certain people that, that do a lot more for a show than others. It depends who the person is. And they are also all volunteer? They are all volunteers. Um, that is awesome. <clears throat> we have a caretaker for the building. Um, he gets paid. It's actually a part-time position, but he's there all the time. Uh, he also runs lights for us. He's an excellent self-taught lighting artist. Um, we do pay our sound people who have to come in. We may be buying our own sound system this year. We'll see, uh, but that we'll still have to pay sound people to come in. Uh, we pride ourselves on really good sound, really good lighting. We've had compliments from people that tour Europe and say that the that the level of lighting they see in our venue is is like 300 seaters in Europe but more like a thousand seaters in the U.S. So we're uh, very proud of our systems. That's a compliment. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, uh, I'm going to have to get up to a show. Uh, I'm not proud to say this, but I haven't been up there yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to go this upcoming year when things start, you know, getting, getting back to it. Um, yeah. The fall is, I mean, we have outdoor shows in the summer and, but they're all selling out, but uh, the fall is going to be good. Awesome. So, so speaking of the shows getting back into it, um, you know, COVID-19 is, is at this point of recording this, it's, it's kind of on its hopefully way, you know, way out. Hopefully things are starting to open up, um, knock on wood here. And um, what, what, tell me a little bit about how COVID-19 impacted, you know, the venue and your work. Well, um, we had a, a show that I've been looking forward to for a year uh, from Dublin, uh, this band Lancome, and they were scheduled to play March 13th, spent the whole day March 12th, on and off the phone with the agent, <clears throat> trying to decide where they cancel. They were playing DC that night. Turns out like only a third of the crowd showed up for that show because of the pandemic starting. And uh, we canceled it and we still haven't rescheduled it. We've rescheduled a lot of shows since then. The big change for me personally was that I suddenly had to start thinking about the club overall instead of just concerts because I, I could see us being down for a long time and not having any income mm -hmm. and you know what's going to happen so I immediately started finding grants that we could apply for um, I over the last year I've gotten a lot of grant money to the building uh, to the Arden Club we've installed a new video streaming system which was paid for by grants We've done some live streaming. We've, we've, I've, as you said at the beginning, I lobby for the, the Save Our Stages. This is my friend Tom DeGeorge in Tampa, Florida, the Crowbar, who I uh, um, really admire, one of the leaders in the NEVA organization. We lobbied really hard, and finally at the end of 2020, the bill was passed. The money has still not arrived to these venues. Mm. So as we speak, we're constantly, I, I actually was just talking with Chris Coons, Senator Coons' office yesterday, telling them, you know, that the, the SBA is telling us it won't come to the end, won't start flowing to the end of May, you know, and this is that six months after the bill was passed in Congress. So you have a lot of venues, not us, fortunately, but a lot of venues that I'm friendly with and that I go to from shows that are struggling and that landlords are knocking at the door and they need that money right. so. can't come fast enough huh really really so so when you went from doing live shows to installing that streaming uh platform and and starting to do those kinds of shows how did that transition impact you know you and your team how'd you guys adapt well i mean i honestly i thought it was going to be a a lot more streaming than we ended up doing uh, as other venues did more than we did. Um, but we did have some very successful uh, streams over the past year. Uh, the biggest one was the uh, David Bromberg 75th anniversary uh, as event, which mm -hmm. sold over a thousand tickets um, and uh, at $30 a ticket. And we also had a, a VIP interview between him and Jeff Daniels, which sold hundreds of tickets separately for VIP and uh, t-shirts and posters. And it was just a huge, very, was well-timed. I mean, I think um, 
you know, that at that time people, it was novel. The live streams were still novel in September. Right. Now uh, David's doing another one from a farm uh, in June. And uh, I know it's a harder sell now, you know, everyone's out there going to shows, so in person outside at least. Was there anything in particular that you found to be really challenging about switching over to live streaming in particular? Yeah, well, we um, we try to do it ourselves. So we had a, a homemade website and connected it with YouTube and and uh, had to do all the customer service ourselves. <clears throat> and uh, I can tell you that I didn't get to see much of the show. I was <laughs> sitting there in my mask on my laptop constantly answering emails and sending out solutions to people that couldn't get the video to stream. Because mm. not only was it new technology for a lot of people, but they were older people too, older than me. I'm not that young. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, if I, thankfully the second time we did a stream, the third time it, it was a lot smoother. We got rid of all the, the kinks and things, but um, it was, uh, it was quite interesting, uh, and we we did very well. Uh, David did really well. The band hadn't played together in in a long time. We did it safely. Nobody got COVID, so uh, that was good. Cool. <laughs> now that's that's uh, we had a couple ourselves. Uh, Gable Music put together a couple live streams ourselves, and I can tell you they are uh, they are a beast uh, when you're trying to DIY them. You know. Uh, having your own website trying to deliver them to youtube trying to figure out you know what are the best streaming platforms who to work with and then like you said getting everyone who's watching to you know know how to do it and, and do all that customer service and right on point there with our experience as well um do you guys think that you will continue doing live streams after live shows start back up yeah we'd like to actually um we've um I know that like Sellersville, Pennsylvania is doing a, a live stream ticket along with their regular tickets uh, this summer. And uh, I think I could see us doing that if, you know, if the artist is interested, if especially if it's a sold out show, uh, we could sell a live stream. Um, I think selling them is going to be harder and harder. Mm -hmm. So I think some artists are probably going to stick with, you know, a couple times a year, a kind of special live stream. Uh, but maybe that could be our live stream, you know, for, for a show. I mean, Adrian Lenker from Big Thief is coming this fall. Show sold out in less than a week. And, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to get tickets to see her this fall. So, you know, maybe we could sell a live stream ticket. She would have to agree, obviously. She hasn't really done, but she does Instagram. So it's be kind of like that. And then, and then you got to think about playing all that live music performance music into feeding it into that stream properly too so that's another layer right right i mean we are we are set up we have some cameras built in we like to kind of add cameras so that it has better quality some cinema quality some hand handheld for bromberg we did a nice um kind of i forget what they call that thing but it's a, a camera that moves on this gliding ah. with the slider in front of the stage it made for some really high quality images. Yeah, I forget what that thing's called too, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, just can't think of the name. George, um, George Murphy is our designer and videographer and website designer. He, he's he been just invaluable this whole past year. Um, I know he, he works with Gable sometimes too. It's a great, great company he runs. That's cool. Yeah, I, I haven't personally met him, but he sounds like an uh, invaluable team member uh, for you guys, so. Awesome job. Yeah, he's also producing our Low Cut Connie show. He's he's on their team. Uh, he's the videographer for their Tough Cookies and weekly show. So cool. So so let me ask you a question here. You you have kind of a unique uh, angle here where you're a scientist and you're also a music event producer. Um, so when live shows are returning, you know and and a lot of people are getting vaccinated, some aren't, um, and then there's these new variants. How does that come into play for you? What do you worry about? Well, I mean, it. The, the thing that worries me right now is that there is this drive to reopen and it's, it's happening before we're, you know, vaccinated enough, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and here in Delaware, we have 50 some percent first shot. I mean, that's not, you know, that's, a, that's nowhere near herd immunity. And um, so, you know, I went to a restaurant the other day, I've been vaccinated for a few months actually. And, um, you know, I, I saw that there were just so many people in the restaurant and I thought, you know, what if, what if 40% of these people aren't vaccinated? These plexiglass screens aren't going to help prevent COVID transmission mm -hmm. in this room, you know? So I know that. And I, and then I, then the, so the reopening makes me worry. And I see bands canceling their fall shows moving in the spring. So people might think we're helping things, you know, in some ways. But if we lose all of our music shows in the fall, or a lot of them, because of this, that's going to be, you know, be better to wait two months and actually have a full fall schedule without people canceling. This is, this is, uh, not everybody agrees with me on this. I have venues that, you know, are ready to, especially in the, the in places that where COVID didn't hit as hard, obviously they're, uh, they're less, they're more like, let's get out there. Let's do this now. Oh, I mean, you make a good point and, and you see it as well. I mean, people are, are raring and ready to go. You know, they, 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 they're excited, they're optimistic. Um, everyone wants to get out and, you know, things are turning around and, and whatnot. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that could cause uh, a little bit, I think, of a premature kind of flow to, to opening things, um, you know, a little too quickly for those people who aren't vaccinated and, and whatnot. So, yeah, you, I mean, that's a really good, really good point and, 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 and a very real, I think, fear to have. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen that way, but, but I totally hear you on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, thankfully, outdoors has been shown to be quite safe. You know, we, we, we still have social distancing plan for our outdoor shows, but uh, it does sound it's like it's a lot harder to, get, to spread this. Uh, and I personally think most of our audience will be vaccinated, probably over 80%, if I had to guess. But I'm going to be doing some surveys to see exactly what's the case there. Well, that'll be interesting to find out, you know, what the, what that level is when we get to it, for sure. Yep. Uh, all right. So here's a little quick lightning round. Uh, I heard you met Springsteen. Do you uh, do you happen to remember what he said or you said? <laughs> I, I don't think he said anything, but <laughs> I um, it, I had like 12 seconds and I, I had fully prepared what I was going to say. I had practiced it and I think I got it right. I said, I said, um, I bought Born to Run on the day it was released when I was 12 years old and it's remained ageless for me ever since. It sounds like you still remember what you practiced of that. <laughs> I think that's pretty much what I said. And they just look at you? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. There's a photo of me with him and he's looking at me and I'm looking at the camera and it, you know, it looks like he's great he's really glad to meet me oh it's the only photo that came out the other one i'm like half out of the picture <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny that's sweet though that's cool meeting people that you that you look up to like that um now i i also know that you stood at the met in 89 when wag they did the wagner's performance of the ring and it was yeah a, i'm a, I'm, a, I'm an opera fan as well he's a classical fan mm -hmm. um not been going to as much classical lately but yeah at the at the met for the ring it's like 16 hours of music which is like over 20 hours of of uh you know with intermissions and everything and uh yeah for a five hour opera to stand there at, at the top of the building as far away from you can be um i even you know snuck in for one of the performances i will admit i was in my 20s and uh i handed five dollars to the the guy at the Cape at the door, who uh, I was told would let me in, so I snuck in. <laughs> Pretty great vibe. Talk to this guy. Give him five bucks to let you in. So, so why? What prompted you to do this? I, was it like a big craze at the time? I mean, this was a for, for opera fans. This was a really famous production. Uh, James Morris, Hilgard Barons. Um, it's on video. It was broadcast. In fact, one of the shows I, one of the performances I saw is the performance on the DVD, if you if you buy it. Oh, from, cool. From 1989. So uh, I think it was a Saturday matinee that week. And um, 
I was actually doing my PhD thesis in Long Island, my research, and I took Long Island Railroad in each time to see the opera and then go back to my lab. <laughs> <laughs> Hardcore fan. Uh, speaking of fans, do you have any favorite artists uh, that you've hosted at Guildhall? Well, um, Richard Thompson uh, mm -hmm. played uh, Arden in 2006. And that was, I think that may always have the record for fastest sellout because we actually never, never posted it online or anything. We never, uh, we just emailed a small, relatively small group of people and set up a, a ticket booth for two hours every day in front of the guild hall and sold the tickets in person uh, in a total of like eight hours over four days. Uh, Steve Tanzer from my team, I think, uh, who's done a lot of our shows, book, uh, ran that ticket booth. So uh, that was great, of course. Uh, David Johansson of the New York Dolls and Buster Poindexter. It was really exciting presenting him. Um, we've just had, we've had a lot of wonderful performers. Um, uh, I'm hoping that the fall, you know, we had John Schofield, the amazing guitarist. We've had um, great musicians from Africa, like Habib Kwate uh, and his band Bamada. Uh, Songhoi Blues, who I just saw on TV for performing from Mali for WXPN, they played here. And we actually had David Dye and Dan DeLuca of the Philadelphia Inquirer here for that show. So we got a lot of shows that really stand out. Now, now you don't have to say any names here, but do you have any pet peeves or anything with how artists act or, you know, when they come play shows? <laughs> I mean, I the vast majority of the artists have been very kind. Uh, they've hung around after the show. They've met the audience. Uh, when, a, when an artist doesn't want to come out and meet anyone, it's kind of annoying because it's a small venue and I think, you know, they should do that. Um, I prefer that. Uh, we've had a few artists where, they, where their staff, the people they bring with them, treat us without re disrespectfully. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, a few instances of my people being mistreated, at least verbally, um, mm -hmm. stand out over the years. And uh, as you know, in one case, made me not bring that artist back because I just didn't want that person back in the building. It wasn't the artist; it was their manager or whoever. Yeah, just just keep you know everybody being nice to each other would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. to to get those things going. Um, all right. Well, that was uh, those were the quick questions there. Uh, I I, I want to know. Obviously, you do your uh, teaching still, right? Yes, I teach at Villanova mm -hmm. and uh, I teach remotely for the past year on Zoom. And uh, in fact, I have a couple more exams to grade uh, <laughs> and then I'm done. So do you, so even, okay, so regardless of COVID and Zoom and all those kinds of things, how do you stay on track and motivated between your, you know, your job and this music career that you've built volunteer work wise do you have any routines or anything that keep you on i mean i honestly don't uh i don't feel like i have a real special uh way that i deal with this stuff i mean i i don't even keep very good lists you know sometimes throw things on my calendar when i need to remind myself i'm, I'm good at searching my email to find things <laughs> uh, but like i've met you know real, you know, booking people for venues that are doing, you know, 500 shows a year and seeing some of the organizational tools they use to keep things in order. And I, I just marvel at how well they do it. I don't do it that well, honestly, but, but usually I don't, you know, don't forget things. And I, I, uh, I go to see a lot of music. I'm going to see Ron Gallo tonight in Philadelphia. I'm going to see Tom Petty Appreciation Society at the same venue tomorrow night in Philly. Uh, I'm planning trips to visit Neva venues all over the country this summer. Uh, so I, I I do a lot of things related to music and that keeps me, and I listen to a lot of music. And so uh, that's what keeps me going. That That's actually really poetic that, that you know, the, the thing that you're doing as a volunteer 
you know, job or work it is really what keeps you grounded at the same time. That's kind of, that's kind of what was cute. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, the uh, actually became a, a, a kind of crazy, always going to concerts kind of person over the last 15 years when I started booking concerts. I, you know, before that I was raising kids and didn't go to nearly as many concerts. So. Well, that sounds like a, like, like a really good thing to do. Do you, do you have any advice for that you would have given your past self to get yourself to where you are any easier or quicker? <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, in terms of music, I kind of, I wish I hadn't spent so many years kind of not going to the legendary musicians who were performing because I was so wrapped up in the latest music that was coming out. Um, so I, uh, there's people I never got to see like David Bowie and, uh, but there's people I did get to see like Prince twice. And so, you know, it happens. You don't get to see everybody, but as a, a friend of mine says, you can't do everything, but I, but I certainly try. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool so um we're kind of rounding the end of the interview here um if if an artist wants to uh, get in touch with you work with you or play at the guild uh what's the best way for them to get in touch well uh, my email is concerts at ardenclub.org um but i get a ton of emails so you know don't be offended if you don't get a reply uh, <laughs> you're being honest <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, my organization is to let it slide down my inbox and then, you know, Google might say, are you going to reply to this? And then I might reply then. But um, the, uh, of course, our, our, if you want to hear our social media handles now or. Go for uh, it. I mean, we have um, on, on Facebook, it's Arden Concert Guild, G-I-L-D. And uh, for things that are more generally happening at the hall, Arden Guild Hall. And there's also the Arden Fair, which is a big annual event that we do. And, and my team does the music for that. That's a free event. Is it going to happen this year? Don't know. Um, it's Labor Day weekend. Um, at Arden Concerts on Instagram and on Twitter are the other two handles for us. And um, the Shady Grove Music Fest is probably the, the biggest thing uh, that we're selling right now that hasn't sold out yet. <laughs> Almost everything else is sold out uh, for the summer. And when uh, is that again? It's going to sell out. When is that one again? That's July 10th. Mm -hmm. And that is on the Arden Concert Guild page. Also ArdenConcerts.com. Uh, any live streams that we're partnering on, we do a lot of live stream partnering uh, with Mandolin and with Noon Chorus. And uh, like Milk Carton Kids is coming up. The David Bromberg show is coming up um all live streams if you want to do that but uh, also look under shows and all of our fall shows marshall crenshaw is on sale for december <laughs> so we have a lot of shows awesome so that kind of that kind of rounds out everywhere where people can find you there's a lot of places people can find you including your email and your website and all the social medias um i appreciate you taking the time to uh, have a little chat with me today and talk about the guild hall and the concert guild and uh the club and clearing all that up for me <laughs> mm -hmm. appreciate sure. it um and i also want to thank everybody who's watching uh, if you like what you saw give us a thumbs up smash that bell uh, did we answer all your questions? Do you have any more questions for Ron or for us? Uh, if you have anybody you want us to uh, pursue for an interview, we'd love to hear your ideas. Just leave them in the comments below. Um, otherwise, that's it for our conversation with Ron today. Thanks, Ron. We'll see you later. Thank you.